Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who were persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. It's great to see you. Glad that you're here. Great to have a full house. Amen. If you are in our overflow room or uh, maybe one of our lobby areas watching on TV, I'm glad that you're with us as well. And if you are tuned in online, uh, glad that you are watching from wherever you are. Uh, it is great to see everybody again. Hope you had a great week last week. We're going to continue what we started last week, which is a 32-week journey through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' longest recorded teaching in Scripture found in Matthew chapter 5 all the way through chapter 7. So why don't you grab your Bible, take it out, and open to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Matthew chapter 5. This series is called Kingdom Come. It's 32 weeks long. Again, it covers the Sermon on the Mount. And what we've done is we've taken these 32 weeks and broken it up into four different sections. And so this first section is called Kingdom Come. Attitudes. It's what we usually call the Beatitudes, also known as the beautiful attitudes. It's characteristics. Jesus launches into the Sermon on the Mount and gives characteristics of those who are, who are a part of the kingdom of God, characteristics of those who have aligned their lives with His. And He launches into the sermon with, the, with what I would argue is the single most important statement. He said, it, last week we looked at it in verse 3, He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked last week that the word blessed literally means genuinely happy, not this kind of fleeting, temporary, uh, rooted in a <clears throat> kind of fleeting pleasure of the world, but a genuine happiness beyond circumstances. Blessed, genuinely happy are the poor in spirit. We talked about the fact that poor in spirit is literally the ability to acknowledge our spiritual bankruptcy. The fact that without Jesus, there is no hope. We have no hope. There's no way to be good enough, to do enough. No family tree, no religious system bridges the gap between God and man because of sin. Only Jesus does that. And we only get that applied to our lives. We only get that relationship with Jesus Christ when we acknowledge that we are spiritually poor. And so he launches into a sermon saying, look, basically saying the, the rest of this sermon, the rest of what I got to say is only going to matter if you've acknowledged that without me you have no hope. And then now that you've acknowledged that, he begins to list other attitudes. And so today we find the second kingdom attitude, and we call this the comfort of mourning. So again, in your Bible, it's Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 4, <clears throat> and this is what it says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Genuinely happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we spend these next few moments in your word, I pray that you would prepare our hearts and our minds for what you have for us. God, I pray that our ears would be open to receive. And God, I pray today as we've gathered together, I'm thankful for this crowd, full house today, God. And God, I pray that those that have come in with heavy hearts and hopelessness, and those that come in longing for a work that only you can do, God, I pray today that you would do that work. God, let us be comforted by your presence today. Father, I pray that you would speak into relationships and situations that seem far off from you, and you would bring them close by. And God, I pray today as we spend these next few moments in your word, that God, if there is anyone that is here that has yet to trust Jesus as Savior, God, I pray today you would call them by name to your side. King Jesus, I pray you do the work of salvation that only you can do. 
And God, I pray today that you would be glorified and that your church would be blessed. It's in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so there's the statement, <clears throat> the, the kingdom attitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, I know that we all know what mourning is. We don't need a, a definition of that. But if you did look up mourning in Webster's Dictionary, you would find that it is deep sorrow or, or, or deep grief or what we would call as godly sorrow. It's that, it's that place of, of, of loss, right? We, the reason why we don't need to give a definition is because all of us <clears throat> have experienced mourning, right? We've all experienced mourning, maybe for different reasons. Uh, mourning is something that we experience when we lose something or someone. It's that, that grief that comes over us, that sorrow that washes over us, that acknowledgement that something that we hoped for or maybe something that we had, we no longer hope for or we no longer have. This beatitude could sound like a paradox. I said last week that that's really, these kingdom attitudes, they all seem like a paradox. They seem like two opposites that don't belong together. Genuinely happy are those who mourn. What? Genuinely happy are those who mourn because through mourning <clears throat> they shall be comforted. It seems like a paradox. There's a guy named G.K. Chesterton. He was an author and theologian. And he said this. He said that a paradox, something that brings two opposites together, a paradox is a truth standing on its head calling for attention. Think about that statement. A paradox is a truth standing on its head calling for attention. Attention. Think about if you were walking down the street and there are a lot of passerby, you know, passersby, there's a lot of foot traffic. And as you walk down the street, maybe you're at an amusement park, you're at a, a sporting event, you're in New York City, you're somewhere where there's a lot of people walking around. You don't pay attention to each and every person because there's so many people, right? You're just trying to get through to where you're headed. But imagine as you're walking through all this foot traffic, there's someone up ahead of you standing on their head screaming. You think that would catch your attention? Yeah, that's what G.K. Chesterton said. He said that a truth, a paradox is a truth standing on its head calling for attention. So the question is, what is the truth that Jesus is trying to get our attention to? What is the truth that he's calling out to us? What does he want us to recognize in this statement? He's saying that when you <clears throat> realize you're poor in spirit, when you realize you're spiritually bankrupt, and you have no hope but Jesus. And when you call upon the name of Jesus and receive salvation, in that moment, you are given comfort. You see, the, the, the text doesn't go like this. It doesn't go the first kingdom attitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and they will never mourn. It doesn't say that. <clears throat> it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Coming to Jesus, acknowledging our spiritual bankruptcy, is not about not mourning. It's about what happens when we mourn. It's about the capacity and the ability because of Jesus that in the midst of mourning to still have genuine happiness, to have joy that isn't based on a circumstance. And it's this acknowledgement as believers that when we mourn, we never mourn alone. You never walk through a valley without the hand of Jesus. You never experience a loss without Jesus there. He intercedes on our behalf. We have the Comforter, the Holy Spirit with us. You see, once we come to Christ, it's not that we don't mourn. It's that we don't mourn like we used to. We don't mourn without hope. And by God's sovereignty, check this out, by God's sovereignty, He takes mourning and makes it a path to His presence and His comfort. <clears throat> By God's complete control, he takes mourning and he makes it a path to his presence and his comfort. Let, let me be clear about something, beloved. Satan is the prince of this world. And he's been, giving a, he's been given a season of rain because of sin in this world. And there are times in our lives that we will walk the road of life and the very road we walk will be paved by Satan. He has laid those paved stones of pain and destruction. Jesus says that he comes to, that, that, that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And sometimes he lays those paved stones. God does not perpetrate, does not cause evil, but because of sin, he does allow it to happen. We see this in the Old Testament, the book of Job, right? Last year we preached through the book of Job. And we talked about the fact, not familiar with the story, it's in the Old Testament. There's a guy named Job, he's got a great family. He's got material wealth. He's got it all. And the book of Job opens with a scene in the throne room of God. <clears throat> and in that scene, Satan walks in. 
And he walks in, and God says, hey, Satan, what are you up to? And he says, oh, you know, I've just been going to and fro on the earth, seeking who I can mess with, seeing whose life I can make miserable. And this is the crazy part, and, you know, his ways are higher than our ways. God says, have you considered my servant Job? God, God brought the idea. He said, have you thought about Job? He's blameless. There's no one like him. And Satan says, well, of course he worships you. He's got a fat bank account. He's got healthy kids. He's got a great life. He has no reason to, to, to curse your name. Let me afflict him, and then let's see what happens. And God doesn't cause what happened to Job, but he did allow it. And the rest, or not the rest, but the next part of the book of Job is, is Satan laying the pave stones for Job. Job would lose all ten of his children. Ten funerals one day. Boom. He would lose all of his material wealth. Pavestone. Boom. His body would be afflicted with sores and boils. The text tells us that he, this is, I don't mean to be graphics, but the text says he would scrape his sores with broken pieces of pottery, cover his head in ash. And that road that he was walking, that, that mourning and that destruction and that sorrow, Satan was able to lay those pavestones. But hear me, beloved, even though Satan may pave the road, he does not get to decide where it leads to. God determines the destination. And if you read the book of Job, 40 plus chapters, what you find at the end of it is while Satan was laying the pavestones for Job to curse God and die... God decided at the end of that road, because of Job's faithfulness, that Job would be blessed. See, Satan can pave the way, but God decides where it leads. And that's what's unique for the believer. Yes, you'll still mourn. Yes, you'll still be uh, subject to the brokenness of this world. But each step you take, even though the, the brokenness of this world is paving the way, even though Satan may be paving the road, God's going to determine where that road will lead you. And don't forget this fact, beloved, that the enemy does not know God's business. Satan doesn't know God's business. I hear people say this. I don't want to be the theology police, but when I hear really bad stuff, we've got to correct it. I hear people make comments about, you know, Satan's peeking into my future. Or you, you, you better watch out because Satan's looking into your future. He's not, he can't look into your future. He does not have the capacity to do so. He is created being. God is creator. You know, how, you know how I know Satan can't look into my future? Because he didn't look into Jesus's. You look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Starting around verse 6, the Apostle Paul begins to write about the wisdom that is available to believers. He's talking about this wisdom that we can receive. And as he talks about the wisdom that we can receive, he talks about those who don't have it, the, the, those that's not available for. And starting in verse 8, this is my own paraphrase. Starting in verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, The rulers of this age don't know this wisdom that I talk about. The rulers of this age, they, they don't know what I'm talking about because if they did have access to this, they would not have executed Jesus. So he says, paraphrase, he says, if they knew what was going on, if they knew what was going to happen, they wouldn't have executed Jesus. He says, what, you know, no, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, no mind has concocted the thought of what Jesus can do. And when Paul writes that the rulers of this age didn't know what they were doing, who do the rulers of this age subject themselves to? Satan. So what does that mean? Satan didn't know what was going on either. See, Satan might, might have thought he was paving the Calvary Road, but Jesus knew where it was leading. I believe with all my heart that Satan, when Jesus breathed his last breath, thought that he won. I believe Satan heard it is finished, and he took it, he took it a different way. And I think he threw a party, and it was probably a pretty good one. It lasted about three days, and then Jesus crashed it because he walked out of the tomb. When Jesus says it's finished, it meant something different than what Satan thought. I think of the old hymn we used to sing in church, it is finished, right? The battle is over. And Satan's defeated, like... He doesn't realize it. Maybe, maybe he does. I mean, he, but he, he's done. He lost that one. He's going to lose the next one too. The battle is over. There'll be no more war. That's what the song says. You know why it's finished? The song says because Jesus Christ is Lord. And so understand this, that even though we may walk the road of mourning that Satan gets to pave, God determines where it's going to take us. 
See, Satan didn't know what the cross would be. Satan didn't know that because of the cross, God would take our mourning and turn it into dancing. And so, yeah, genuinely happy are those who mourn because they get comforted. Because they, they mourn and they have sorrow in a heavy heart, but it's, not, it, it, it's detached from the hope that's not connected to this temporary world. It's, it's, a, it's a hope that, 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 that supersedes what Satan can do. And, and hear me, when the text tells us, when the kingdom attitude says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted, it's not talking about some one-time fix. Say this prayer, take this pill, you know, re- 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 recite these words, and, and it's done. It's a, it's a lifetime. It's Jesus taking the moments of our life. The ups and the downs, and in each moment providing joy in the morning, and in each moment being sufficient and being enough so that we can be genuinely happy even when we mourn because we know that in our mourning we are comforted. All that to say, what does mourning look like in our lives, right? It's a one-verse sermon today. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So what does it look like when we mourn? I think there's two types of mourning we experience. The first one is natural mourning. Natural mourning, and hear me, beloved, natural mourning is no respecter of persons. Natural mourning touches every one of us as we experience loss and heartache. It's the natural result of living in a broken world. And when I say that, understand this. A mark of spiritual maturity isn't the ability to be stoic and not, be, not have emotion. The mark of spiritual maturity isn't this ability to to not mourn when it's time to mourn. Natural mourning is by default the natural response to a broken world. When do we experience natural mourning? We experience loss. Probably the most common and, and most powerful type of mourning is that connected to death. We experience natural mourning when we lose a loved one. It, it's it's it's. It's so even though it maybe as believers and the one who has passed away was a believer and we know their hope, we know their future, there's still that mourning. There's that death. There's that shift. So we, we mourn over death. We, mo- we mourn over dreams sometimes, right? Some of us, we've had dreams when we were younger and we wanted to accomplish this or do that and maybe they were godly dreams and maybe they weren't. But life caught up and God had different plans or we made different plans and sometimes that dream dies it gets left behind and we lose that and we can naturally mourn over that we naturally mourn over relationships the reality of our society and i know many in this room have been affected by this is that according to statistics a whole lot of marriages are ending in divorce today and i believe when divorce happens one of the two experiences mourning the sorrow over natural loss you can you can mourn not just over marriage or romantic relationships, but friendships, right? Seasons of life change. Friendships from childhood, from college, from workplaces. Maybe you mourn over a change in work. You loved what you were doing, and you go to a new place. It's just a reality. You know, I've done ministry for almost 20 years now. The first six years, I served at one church in the Dallas area. And so for six years, I worked with a certain group of people. And we did life together, and, and they were there when I got married, and they were there when my first son was born. There was a whole lot of ups and downs in those six years. But then God called me away, and, and yes, many of those people were still friends, and when I see them, we, we kind of pick up where we left off, but the truth is it's not the same. Now, I have new people, praise God, that I do life with. But I can mourn over that shift. We mourn over death. We mourn, mourn over the loss of dreams, the, the loss of relationships. Here's one that our society relates to, and it's a great day to bring it up as there's a lot of jerseys in the room. We mourn over sports, right? <laughs> Around 10.30 p.m., the Giants fans will mourn tonight, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> We get most excited about that point in the sermon. But uh. 2016, right? The Golden State Warriors mourned over a 3-1 lead that was taken away by the Cleveland Cavaliers. This, don't clap for that. (laughs) Don't clap for the Warriors either, for that matter. But this past February, the Atlanta Falcons mourned as they saw a 28-3 lead go away when the New England Patriots would win yet another Super Bowl. Maybe that's too 
far in the past. And so this past weekend, last week, there was mourning the Texas A&M Aggies as they saw a 34-point lead go away to the UCLA Bruins. No clapping, no clapping, no clapping, no clapping. <laughs> right? We, we know what natural mourning is. We know that it touches us, and, and there's different levels to the way that it affects us. But natural mourning is a part of this life because it's a broken world. King Solomon would write in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that there's a time to mourn. There's, there's a time to weep, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. But the weight of that statement, a time to mourn and a time to dance, the, the, the question or the possibility of that is done away with when you know Jesus. It's not that there might be a time to mourn. and it might, Yeah, you're going to mourn, but you better believe he's going to take the mourning and turn it into dancing. He's going to make sure that your, your blessedness, your genuine happiness, your joy is not taken away. And so natural mourning. But the, the other type of mourning, and, and the mourning that I believe Jesus was really alluding to, I, I think that we can completely talk about natural mourning and apply it to this kingdom attitude. But I think the weight of the kingdom attitude where Jesus said, Genuinely happy, blessed are those who mourn. He's talking primarily about spiritual mourning. Now, just like everybody naturally mourns, everybody spiritually mourns, but I'll get more into that in just a minute. There is a spiritual mourning that takes place. And it only takes place when we come to Christ by grace through faith. We come to Jesus, and the depth of spiritual mourning is when without Jesus we have certain attitudes and actions. We call them sins. And maybe we thought they were, they were pleasing or cute, or we didn't even care. We had certain actions and attitudes that defined us. When we come to Jesus, those sinful actions and attitudes grieve us. And so let me say some hard words. If you're calling yourself a believer and you're not grieved over your sin, you need to make sure that you're a believer. We spiritually mourn over our sin. That, that is connected to the previous kingdom attitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When you realize you're poor in spirit, it brings about some mourning. Now, you take the mourning to Jesus, and you receive his comfort, and it changes things. But we are, we are able to spiritually mourn over our sin. And so I just ask you, does that resonate with you at all today? You think of your pride, your lust, your sinful attitudes. When I think of those things, does it cause mourning within me? You see, it's a beautiful thing, beloved, to be confronted with our sin. It's a beautiful thing to be able to be confronted with our sin and, and to not rationalize it and to not say, well, it's socially acceptable. Everyone, everyone lies in the workplace. Everyone cheats on their taxes. Every, you know, it's just a casual conversation in the workplace. It's not like I'm having an affair. It's just this. It's just that. No, no. It is a wonderful thing for the believer to be faced with his or her sin and to not default to rationalize it or, or to say it's socially acceptable, but to call sin, sin, to grieve over it, to be comforted by the Spirit and to be pushed forward in sanctification. That is a wonderful thing. It's the story of the prodigal son. We brought him up last week just briefly. The story of the prodigal son, right? It's the son who tells his dad, hey, dad, I want my inheritance now. In essence, saying, I wish you were dead. Whereas the, the father in that context, in that society, would have every right to have his son executed. He actually gives his son half of his net worth. He says, you want it? Here you go. The son leaves, goes off, lives wild and free, hosts all the parties, pays for everybody's drink, makes it rain, right? Until it runs out. It runs out, all the paid-for friends aren't there anymore. Text tells us that he got a job taking care of pigs just to live. Thinks to himself one day, these pigs are eating better than me. And in this moment, the text tells us that he realized, he thought to himself, even my father's servants have a better life than me. Maybe I can go home and be one of my father's servants. Reading between the lines, what's it saying? He recognized his actions and he grieved. He mourned that he was in that state. 
And so we spiritually mourn over our sin. In a few moments, we'll have a time of response. And I believe some of us today, you need to come forward and you need to mourn over some sin. You need to confess some sin that's been in the dark. You need to get it out there. You need to grieve over it. And you need to know that you're not grieving over it to stay in it. You're grieving over it to get past it. But spiritual mourning isn't just the capacity and the ability to mourn over our individual sin. Spiritual mourning is also when we mourn over the sins of the world. It's when we mourn over the sins of our society and our community. And yes, part of spiritual mourning over the sins of the world is realizing the depravity, right? The, 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 the sickening state of our society. But it's not just that. See, for too many believers, that's, what, that's, all, that's all it is for us. Our mourning over the sin of our world is just the fact that we see the depravity of it and we cast judgment on it. What, what good is spiritually mourning over the sins of the world if all it leads to is judgment and condemnation? And so, yes, we do mourn because we live in a depraved society. We do mourn because of the state of things. But, but oh, that as believers, right? Oh, that as believers, we wouldn't just be vocal about the depravity of society and how it seems to be spiraling out of control. Oh, that we wouldn't just say, I can't believe that the Supreme Courts have allowed same-sex marriage, and I can't believe that this is allowed and that's allowed, and I can't believe this person's in office or that person's in office. I can't believe what these people do or those people do. I can't believe what's happening. That we wouldn't just mourn spiritually in a way that recognizes the depravity, but that we would mourn because we recognize the depravity is connected to lostness. The depth of spiritual mourning isn't just saying, oh, look, the world's in trouble. We're going to hell in a handbag. It's saying, I can't believe we're in so much trouble. And instead of rushing to judgment and condemnation, we realize that we're on a rescue mission with Jesus. And so we weep over the lostness of our society. Beloved, hear me, I've said this before. Anytime there is an election, I encourage you to vote. We have the freedom in one hand, and you could argue the obligation in the other. Be wise and pray over it and get out and vote. And like I say all the time, I don't mean to offend you, but if, if, you, wanna, if you didn't vote and you want to complain about who's in office, don't complain to me. But the flip side of that equation is this. We need to understand that the cure and the hope for our depraved society is not a political party or person or system or platform. It is Jesus. And it moves us past, it moves us past simply mourning over depravity and mourning over lostness to look out across our community and recognize that there are so many people that have not realized their spiritual bankruptcy. They haven't come to terms and responded to the voice of Jesus calling them out of darkness into marvelous light. In the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Do you know why he's called the weeping prophet? Because he weeps over the state of his people. The book of Nehemiah, it's a shorter book. Maybe you've heard of him. We usually think of Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, right? The book of Nehemiah makes it clear that he wept, he mourned, yes, over the physical state of his city, but more than that, the spiritual state, as they had turned their back on God. You know, I like to say that I practice transparency, so I'm going to do it again. I'm asking you not to judge me, all right? You know, if you've been around, that I talk a whole lot about revival in the Rio Grande Valley. I long for it. I pray for it. I believe in it. But, you know, anytime there's a sermon preached, just so you know, whoever's preaching, the sermon always does business with us first, right? Isn't that unfortunate, guys? And this week, the Lord did some business with me with this sermon, and it wasn't that he, you know, he chastised my desire for revival or my prayers or my strategies or my efforts or my, it wasn't that. What the Lord made abundantly clear to me is it's great to, to pray for revival, to long for revival, to strategize and plan and hope. 
But until I weep over the lostness of my valley, my people, revival is a pipe dream. I confess to you, beloved, I I haven't been there yet. I've longed, I've hoped, I've prayed, I've planned. But God opened my eyes this week to the fact that I need to start weeping over the lostness of this valley. Because it's not that we weep and we stay on our knees in weakness. We weep and we march forward in boldness knowing that Jesus is the answer. And I'm just, I'm telling you, I am asking the Lord to take me there. And that seems like a paradox. Why would you want the Lord to take you to a place of mourning? Because I know when I get to that place of mourning, there's comfort. Beloved, I'm drawing my line in the sand. I'm saying that this, 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 these are my people. I may not be from the valley, but I'm a transplant now. I'm from the almost valley. (laughs) And I'll tell you, I I need to apply that because I will confess to you, I have mourned over the people of Alice, Texas. And I need to remember to do that here. It's this spiritual agony. It's this anguish to look out. We should not be able, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you should not be able to look out across your neighborhood and your kids' schools, or if you're a student, your, your schools and your teams, your organizations, your workplaces, your families. We should not be able to look across the landscape of our community and see the lostness because it's there. We shouldn't be able to look out and see it and not mourn over it. So there's natural mourning, there's spiritual mourning, but how do we get comforted in the midst of mourning, right? In light of the fact that natural mourning touches all of us, that we face it, we feel it, in light of the fact that spiritual mourning is a part of the reality for the believer, how do we then know that we're genuinely happy because we mourn and receive comfort? There's, again, two things. I believe that to press into the comfort that is available for us and to walk in the blessedness that Jesus says is possible, the first thing we have to choose is we have to choose community. you got to choose community. We talk about this a lot at the church. You know, we want people to plug into community. We talk a lot about our community groups. We talk a lot about serving in ministry, your ministry team. We try to provide avenues and platforms this coming weekend. The ladies simulcast. If you haven't signed up, you can sign up. It'll be a large community, but it's still a smaller pocket than this room. We push community because here's the deal. Those of us that have faced natural mourning, did you notice the comfort that came when when your extended family, when your church family, when your friends came alongside you? The truth is none of us really want to be alone when we're hurting. Now, I'm not saying that the goal of community, and hear me, beloved, the goal is not that when somebody hurts, somebody loses a loved one, and we rush in to fix it. We swoop in with our Bible verses. You know, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. I can do all things. You know, it's not to swoop in and, and to, to have the answer. That, that's not the community I'm talking about. It's the community that where we come together, and when, when I hurt, you hurt, and you hurt, I hurt. Many times the the blessing and the comfort that comes from community doesn't come from the words. In fact, going back to Job in the Old Testament, when he lost his, his children and his finances and his health, some of his friends showed up, and for seven days they sat in silence, and that was the best thing they did. Things went downhill when they opened their mouth. But community becomes that place when we naturally mourn that there's a, 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 a comfort there. But, but not just that. The truth is it's not. See, here's the reality. Anybody can have community. You don't have to be a believer. Right? You ha- maybe you got your neighborhood. You got your golf buddies. You're a member of the Lions Club. I don't know what it is. right? But there are community outlets everywhere. By the way, the Bible tells us that we're created in God's image. The fact that we all long, there's no, there's no one who doesn't long for a community, right? When I was a youth pastor, there'd be, there'd be students in my youth group, they'd, oh man, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm 
that this is like 10 years ago, so terms have changed, but emo, right? It's like, oh, yeah, man, I don't, I don't need community. And, and, and there were these students I would talk to, and they'd talk about how they're loners and they don't need anything. But the funny thing I'd always point out to them, do you realize how all the kids and all blacks sit together? Like all the emo kids sit to, you're not actually sitting by yourself. We intrinsically long for community. I'm just, I, was, I was a jerk. I was like, you're, you're not a loner. You sit with all those dudes over there. I mean, <laughs> like you're a loner, go to the back or something. I don't know. But what, why, why do we long for community? Because eternity has been put in the hearts of men because we have been created in his image. And so anybody can find community for natural mourning. But when it comes to spiritual mourning, it's not just community, beloved. It's kingdom community. It's this ability to have people around us who know us. Don't you hate that when people know you? And they come alongside you, and they're the people that say, hey, what's going on when you're, when you're hurting, but you're trying to be tough? And they're the ones that know it. Hey, what's going on? Nothing, I'm fine. No, you're lying. What's going on? They're the people that say, hey, I've noticed this. You know, I haven't seen you in church lately. You miss community group. Hey, what's going on? I've seen you talking to that, that other woman. I see you talking to this guy. What's going on? They're the people who, who encourage us, who call us out, and who in the end push us towards Jesus. And beloved, if you are, you know, which you're here, so I'm preaching to the choir, but we live in a society right now. There is this thinking in our society that says, you know, I don't need church. The church is full of hypocrites. I'd rather be in the church with hypocrites who know it than in the world with hypocrites who don't. I'm not going to go to church because, man, there's a bunch of hypocrites. And, there's this, and so there's this push uh, from people I talk to sometimes, like, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Now, hear me. We're not about being Pharisees and saying you need to get your perfect attendance card punched. But the concept that says I don't have to be a part of a church, you know, I just listen to my Christian music and I just kind of do my own thing and I, I listen to podcasts, you miss the point of community. Because, yes, you can go through life on your own as a believer. Behold, spaghetti, exhibit A. You can go through life. Knowing Jesus, right? Well, I'm talking to believers now. And because here's the other thing. You know, some of you, you, you come and you, you sit here, and I'm so thankful that you're here, but this is the extent of it, and there's so much more community for you. The truth is a 1,000 people is not community. It's an amazing place of encouragement to go face the week. But you can say, you know what, I've got Jesus, and that's all I need, and it is all you need, but he wants you to live in community. You say, I don't need anybody, and I don't want to mess with that, and the church is full of hypocrites, and I got burned by the church, and I'm hurt, and all this stuff. And so here's, here's me. Now, we just said that natural mourning touches everyone, right? You with me? It's no respect to a person. So you got Jesus, you have no Christian community, you don't need church, and you go through life, and sooner or later, life goes through you. And you experience loss of a loved one, a relationship falls apart, a dream dies, and when it happens, guess what? It is not that difficult for the enemy to come alongside and break your will. You go through life, and it's not just natural mourning, it's spiritual mourning. And so maybe you're good for a little while, but eventually you wake up to the weight of your sin, and it is crushing down on you. Maybe you open your eyes to the lostness around you, and it's crushing down on you, and you actually begin to spiritually mourn, but you are all alone. You know what that spiritual mourning does to you? It just... That, that, that is the Christian Lone Ranger mentality. You know why we're, we harp on community? I'm going to try not to make a mess. You know why we harp on community? Let me show you. All right, so you're still here, right? There you are. There you are. Same stuff. You go through life, life goes through you. You experience the, the loss of a loved one. You bury a, a, a parent, a child, a, a spouse, a grandparent, a friend. You, you lose a dream. Things don't pan out. You lose a job. You mourn naturally. 
You, you, bear, you feel the weight of your sin, and now you're in community, so you actually go to people and say, I'm struggling with this. You know, I got tempted this week, and I actually gave in, and, and I looked at this stuff online. I had this conversation. I, I'm struggling. The weight of my sin is bearing down on me. You, you realize the state of our community. You say, you know, I just, this week I realized that, that our community is so lost, and it's heavy, and you start sharing that inside of community and you mourn the same way you did by yourself but now you're inside community and so when the enemy comes to use the mourning to press down on you to break you guess what's going to happen you're going to bend a little bit right but notice that it's the same like same thing i just snapped it with my finger why can't why isn't it happening now because there is strength in community that's why the scripture talks about don't forsake the, the assembly, the gathering. Church is what it means. People want to make it mean. It means church. God says when two or more gather, right, what does that mean? More than just you. There is strength in community. And I'm going to hand this off so I don't make a mess. Y'all give it up for Pastor Nick. Thank you, sir. And so how, how do we find the comfort? How do we access the comfort that's available in, in our morning we choose community, and it's a choice. You choose community, and things begin to shift. But here's the second thing, and this is really the weight of it. You know how you, how you find comfort? You choose Christ. Christ is always an ever-present source of help in times of need. Jesus is the one who promised the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Jesus' disciples mourned when he died. They didn't, they didn't get it, right? But then as he walks out of the tomb, they begin to get the picture of redemption and restoration. Then he's going to ascend to heaven. He's going to leave him, but he says, but guess what? It's good for you that I leave because I'm actually going to send you the comforter, the Holy Spirit. It's good for you that I leave. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And so there is this reality of comfort that only comes through knowing Jesus. You want to know the best example I have of this? If you're a believer, let me ask you a question. Have you ever attended a funeral for a non-believer? You know, I've shared before, my, my dad ran a funeral home for 45 years. So that, that means I've done quite a bit of funerals because, especially in the three and a half years that I pastored in, in the Alice community, um, sadly, if there would be 100, 120 funerals that my dad's business would do, Sometimes, sometimes a third, sometimes a fourth, sometimes half of those people didn't have a pastor or minister. And so I was the go-to guy. It wouldn't be uncommon for me to do sometimes 40 plus funerals in a year in that season. And anytime I do a funeral, and the, the fact is, and this is, I guess, a blessing and a curse, most of the funerals I've done have been for people I didn't know. And so I always want to meet with the family to figure out, you know, a little bit about the, the, the deceased and what do I need to share, what stories, what verses. And I would sit down, I sat across the table from families and I would say, tell me a little bit about so-and-so. And sometimes they would tell me about, oh, you know, he, he, he was a great father, he was a great husband. And when he was, you know, 13, he was at church camp and he accepted Jesus or at VBS. And they tell me the story of his salvation and how it played out in his life. But there are also times I would sit down across the table and I would say, tell me about so-and-so. And they would tell me stories and I would try to ask probing questions to find out about that person's eternity. And I've had countless conversations where the flip side on the question of eternity was, well, you know, he wasn't really religious. He wasn't really, you know, he didn't really go to church. But I'll tell you what, he sure was a good old boy. You know, he was kind of rough around the edges. And I would probe and, because I wanted that confirmation. And countless times I've sat across the table from people who could provide no evidence of salvation. And you know when it became clear the weight of that? The service. As I would officiate funerals for non-believers, there was almost a palpable, tangible heaviness in the room that is not present when it's a believer. It's this weight that you just can't get past. And you look at the family on the front row, and it's not just that they mourn. And it's okay to shed tears, by the way. It's okay to, to weep. But, but there's this wailing, and there's this uncontrollable sorrow. And at the end, when the family would pass by the casket for the last time, and they would cling to the body and, and give kisses, and they would do all this stuff, and it was hopeless. 
Because at the core of their being, they thought it was over. And that's not the reality when Jesus is present. I, I like to use my own life. Y'all, y'all know that in February, I attended my mom's service and I shed tears and I was heavy hearted. And I saw her body in a casket, and it caused grief. But I didn't wail, and I didn't cling to her body because she wasn't in the box. She was at the party already. And that's a genuine happiness that comes through mourning, knowing the comfort that Jesus provides. And so I think for us this morning, there are some next steps we need to talk about. There's some next steps. You know, back in the story of the prodigal, the way that story concludes is after the young man realized the problem, the error of his ways, and he thinks, I'll go back home and try to be Try to get re- restored as a servant, maybe, if I'm lucky. And I believe he walked that road back, rehearsing his best speech. Your dad, I messed up, and I know it, but, but I just want to work for you. And as, as he's walking and as he's preparing the speech, the text tells us that while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. Why does the, how does the father see him a long way off? He only sees him a long way off if he's looking for him. And the text doesn't say that the father stood cross-armed, waiting for the son to do the walk of shame. No, the text tells us, knowing that that the patriarchs would have worn robes, he hiked up his robe and ran. He ran to meet his son, and he runs to him, and the son, I believe, maybe launches into his best speech, and the, the dad just shuts him down and hugs him and takes his robe off and puts it on his son and puts the ring on his finger and says, my son who was lost has been found, the dead is now alive, let's go home and have a party, and the comfort of Morning, my beloved, is when we know that Jesus doesn't look at us in judgment, but he calls us by name not to condemn us, but to free us. And there's comfort that comes through the morning over our sins. So what's the next step today? I think there's several possibilities. I think for some of us, today your next step is going to be to choose community. You may want to come forward in this time of response, but really your next step of obedience will be not what you do at this altar, but what you do when you leave. Hit our info center, get on our website, and sign up for a community group. Ladies, register for the simulcast. Sign up for a ministry team. Get plugged in and have the strength of community. For some of us this morning, your next step is going to be to quit playing games You are a believer, you've trusted Jesus, you have the security of eternal life, but there is some undealt with, unconfessed sin in your life, and you need to mourn over that sin today. There will be ministers up here at the altar. You can come forward and you can confess those sins, and and the strength of community can happen right here. You need to mourn over that. Don't get comfortable with sin. I love what John Owen said, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. You think you have casual, socially acceptable sins? That's like saying you got just a little bit of cancer and you're not worried about it. So you need to mourn over your personal sin today. Some of us, I'm convinced in my heart, you need to begin to mourn over the sin of our community. I think a perfectly acceptable response today would be to see our altar lined with people weeping and praying that God would bring revival, praying for lost people by name. Surely you know someone. Praying by name that the grace of Jesus would be irresistible. Calling out the transfer, calling the prodigals to come home. Parents, do you have a prodigal? Why is the altar not the place to to bring that concern? And for some of us, I say this as our ministers come forward. Your right response, your next step today will be to realize that you are broken, you are spiritually bankrupt, and that Jesus is calling you by name today. You need to mourn over your sin for the first time, and you need to trust Jesus to save you from it.
the greatest source of comfort to our morning is Jesus. And he is ready today to comfort you. Would you stand? I'm going to pray. We're going to worship together. We're going to sing and rejoice over the fact that Jesus tells us that we can come just as we are. And so after I pray, would you come just as you are? Would you bring your hurts and your heartaches? Would you come receive prayer? Would you come weep over our valley that Jesus would do a work only he can do? Husbands, would you bring your wives? Parents, would you come down and pray for the child? And would we expect God to do something that only he can do in this time? Father, we call out to you. And God, I pray that in this moment you're preparing hearts, that God, you're speaking clearly. God, I pray in this moment you're dealing with our spiritual bankruptcy. God, I pray in this moment, in this place, that while there may be hearts of mourning, that they would receive comfort. God, you would turn mourning to dancing and tears to laughter. God, I pray you'd give clear conviction. And I pray in this moment that your will would be done. It's in Jesus' name.